Greetings to my fellow brothers and sisters. The day before yesterday, I posted a video making my reflection on the leader of the EFF, Julius Malema. And I must say, I received a lot of your responses. And I thank you for that. I thank you very much for your responses from the bottom of my heart. Uh, today, I'm here empowered. I received a lot of uh, responses, uh, differing views, you know. People saying Julius Malema is the future leader of this country. And some uh, African brothers were saying he's going to lead also uh, the African continent. People were saying it's a gift uh, uh, from God to lead uh, this country. And I tend to, ga to agree with them. Uh, the, 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 your inputs were so enriching. Uh, I'm here today uh, with a lot of information. Uh, some of the information I didn't know. Some referred me to his previous speeches, which I went and checked and realized they are no. Julius Malema has been so consistent from his days uh, as a, a COSAS leader and he has grown uh, as a leader. You know, uh, the EFF is going to be the leader of society in, in the future because of the way he's leading the EFF. There's a lot of people who commented uh, and saying they are criticizing Julius Malema because uh, they love this country. And then uh, some were saying he's a divide, divisive fellow uh, who want to see this country divided. And I, I was asking myself, this country is divided already. If you see, if you look at it, you know, the way uh, there's an inequality in the country, the way... Uh, a majority of black people are struggling and then you look at the, the the privileged white people i'm saying yeah this country is divided it's not the julius malema who is dividing uh, this country I, I'm, now i'm referring to south africa uh, julius malema is trying to fight for equality in my view so that we can live together if you listen to uh, his speeches, he's, he says he's fighting for everybody, but for currently his, the focus is on black people, to, to put black people on the same level as white people, which I agree 100%. So for people to say Julius Malema is the one who is dividing this country, I tend to, to disagree. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, please share your views. Is Julius Malema dividing this country? What's your view? Please go on the comment section and share your view. And on the uh, 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 responses, there are some people who are still raising the issue of VBS. And I don't understand because you see Julius Malema has addressed this uh, narrative uh, in most of his uh, press conferences he says they should bring evidence and there's no evidence he, he, be people who were involved in a VBS scandal have been arrested uh, some of them have been uh, went through court and they were sentenced so, but people to say, to still bring this issue, I, I don't understand why are they. So, but still on that one, I will also uh, welcome your input, your contribution. Like I said, I thank you very much for everybody who contributed. Let's keep the conversation going and then find solution. Uh, we're going for election on the 29th of May. Let's all of us go and vote and vote the party which is going to take uh, this country forward and I believe the EFF uh, will you know take this country forward 
I know a lot of people are still doubting the EFF because they say no, they are going to do the same like what is, has been done by the ANC. I don't agree to that because uh, the EFF has not been tested. Let's go and vote EFF and see what's going to happen. You know, democracy, uh, according to how it works, you say no, a uh, it's a, it's a majority rule. Let's go and vote and give the EFF uh, five years. If they're not uh, delivering, we're going to we're gonna, uh, vote them out uh, come uh, 2029. So let's all of us go and vote uh, and vote political parties which are going to take this country forward. Because as we have seen, uh, the ANC has failed the past 30 years. That's what I, 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 I have observed. So I don't know uh, your views on this one. Please share your views. Let's uh, keep, keep uh, discussing about this. And then we uh, we try to find solutions uh, for, the con- for the benefit of the country. Uh, Julius Malema, I, in my view, is the person who can uh, take this country forward. Is the person who is able to challenge uh, the status quo. I have seen him taking on people like uh, Helen Zille. Uh, Helen Zille, in my view, is a person who is uh, fighting for white privileges. And those are the people who uh, are dividing this country, uh, in my view. I've uh, watched... uh, uh, John Steinies and fighting for the Western Cape and then saying political party mustn't go and campaign in and the Western Cape. And then I was saying, because Western Cape is part of uh, South Africa, every political party is allowed to go and campaign uh, everywhere. When I uh, watch the way he was talking, I, I felt like you know that was being divisive. Uh, I, I, I'm going to play that uh, clip of uh, John Steinhazen and also a clip of uh, Helen Zille where she was asked in David Machavela Studios uh, interviews and the way she responded. I want to uh, uh, hear your views around that as we compared to what Julius Malema is doing for the country. Let's debate around the, those uh, issues to, to say who is divide, who is really dividing this country. Because uh, what I want to see, we need to be uh, fighting for the good of the country, the equality for the whole of this, uh, of this country, not focus on certain uh, a race group but uh, uh, yes let's let, let, let's talk about that uh, I don't have uh, solutions on that and I, I don't know I'm not clear on what needs to be done but I'm saying uh, as we have been debating around the issues of Julius Malema let's continue debating around the issues that I'm raising now and then try to find solutions and with those kind of solution as we go to the elections come 29 may we we vote a party which is going to take this country forward uh, thank you uh, for watching and please do subscribe uh, to this channel so that we can- unlike the rest of the country the biggest enemy of progress and opportunity here in the Western Cape. It's not an ANC government desperately clinging to power like they're doing in the other eight provinces. The biggest risk to continued progress, to continued opportunity and building a better future for all of us in this province is complacency and mercenary parties like the PA, like Rizim Zansi, like Good and like the NCC. Because they're not interested on the ANC? Why aren't they campaigning in Limpopo and the Northwest Province? Why are they coming to the Western Cape? Why are they coming here to try and unseat the only government that created 300,000 jobs last year? Why are they coming here to the only government 
that arrested through its LEAP program over 27,000 criminals in the last year? Why are they coming here? To an economy that's working, with schools that work, that give opportunities for more people, with public transport systems that work. Why here? Why not they're focusing their attention on the real enemy of progress in South Africa, which is the ANC? And I've thought about this, and I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to tell you why. It's because they know that there's nothing left to loot in the other eight provinces. Alles is opgeëerd. Dat is net geld hier in die Westkap. The rest of the country is bankrupt. That's why they want to come to the Western Cape, because they want to get their hands on the budget and the money that's been well looked after by our government here under Alan Windy and his team in the Western Cape. And let me tell you, if they get that right, it's going to be the biggest bank heist you've ever seen. Something that's said a lot about Cape Town, and I like how you've been part of its politics for so long now. It's its level of obvious inequality that people see when they land at the airport and they drive out of the airport. What is your immediate reaction to, one, that comment and the reality of, of the dynamics that the, uh, the city of Cape Town or the Western Cape represent? Well, it's the dynamics of the whole of South Africa. But except that people living in Cape Town have the services mostly that the government is supposed to give them. Mm. Many, many people who live in shacks around the airport and other shacks have come in from conditions of absolute poverty in rural areas where they often do have a house, but they need a job mm -hmm. and they need an income. And that is why they come to the cities. They're prepared to move away from an established house, often, not always, to come to the city to earn a living. And it's inevitable that no government with a scale of urbanization that we have can keep ahead of the curve. And people come to Cape Town and to other major cities primarily because there are jobs. Mm -hmm. And there are only jobs there because there are people with capital and skills who invest and start businesses and offer job opportunities. And the role of the government in that context is not to build a three bedroom house mm -hmm. with a garage and a car in it, for every person. The role of the government is to deliver what it's supposed to do in the constitution, which is basic services. Mm -hmm. So do people have clean water to drink? If ESCOM is generating electricity, do people get electricity in their houses? Do they have refuse removal? Do they have sanitation? Do they have schools? Do they have clinics? Mm -hmm. Do they have roads? Is there public transport? If you say yes to all of those things, then the government is doing what the government should be doing. If people go and erect a shack on an unserviced piece of land, then we have to retrofit that piece of land. And many people think that Camps Bay looks like Camps Bay because the government has delivered Camps Bay. No, the government has not delivered Camps Bay. The people in Camps Bay have built those houses privately. And they've done it through a growing economy which can produce prosperity. And it's those people who run the businesses that create jobs for other people in a process of upliftment. Mm. And so many of those people in Camps Bay pay up to 35,000 rand a month to live in their own homes. They pay that in rates and taxes to the local authority so that we can give free basic services to the poor. Mm. Shouldn't the law of supply and demand in this context also be conscious of, of human needs? We can't, if, if the most expensive house in South Africa is probably found in Cape Town, yes. and the poorest, the cheapest house is probably found in Cape Town, no, two kilometers definitely away. Definitely not. Yeah. The poorest house is definitely not found in Cape Town. I can promise you that. Mm. I can take you to a couple of places where there aren't any rich houses. But the reason that the poorest house in Cape Town can get free basic services and very generous free basic services is because the richest house in Cape Town is paying probably 50,000 Rand a month in rates to the municipality to cross subsidize mm. and support the poor. It's another reason why poor like to come to Cape Town is that there's such high cross subsidies. And in the latest Auditor General's report, the Auditor General himself warns the city of Cape Town mm. 
Your subsidies are so generous for the poor that they might not be sustainable in the long run. So it's... It's not only the DA that can bring that to the table. There are other parties who can do exactly that. Who? Action SA, Mzanzi, and the ANC. Where? <laughs> I don't, there's some who make a solid argument Where? to say they're able, there are some people that can actually do that within Making them. an argument and actually doing it are two fundamentally different things. Never ever believe. EFF? <laughs> <laughs> if EFF comes into power, yeah. South Africa's RAND will crash through the floor. What will cause that? What will cause that is that the economy will completely lose confidence in the future. When investors say there's no future in South Africa, they pull out all their money, they, the RAND crashes, no one wants the RAND anymore, no demand on the RAND anymore. But how could you say that with, with such confidence and yet it's, it's a, you, you don't know, you don't know the type of president Julius and Floyd would be? I can tell you. Perhaps what we need is Julius and Floyd and whatever to become part of government in a province, one province, mm. to see what happens to that poor province. Just one. I'm still curious to know why would you would say a statement like that with such confidence? Well, I do because I know what kind of systems in a democracy lead to prosperity. We don't have to reinvent the wheel in South Africa. We don't have to start experiments. We know from history, we know from all over the world what works for the poor and what doesn't in a democracy. Mm -hmm. Of course, you can have economic growth in an authoritarian state like China, but we've chosen a democracy. And if you want to have a democracy, the only way you can grow the economy and get jobs is through a market system. The very first thing that Julius will do, and this is what he believes in, the leader must control the party. The party must control the state. The state must control the economy and society. That recipe, and everybody knows that from all the history that we've been through in the last three centuries in the world, will completely collapse the economy and turn us into a totalitarian state. We know that. That's why I'm confident to say that. China is different than when you said it. China is an authoritarian state. There's no democracy there. We've chosen democracy. So if you choose democracy first, mm. then you can only make it work with a market economy. You cannot have the party controlling the state and the state controlling society. So that's why I say that with complete confidence, because I learned from history. So never ever judge a political party by what they say. Judge them by what they do. Mm. And the DA is the only party in South Africa, the only one that has a successful track record in governance. There you are, my fellow brothers and sisters. You heard uh, what uh, John Steen Hazen of the DA said. And also you heard uh, what Helen Zille is saying. And when I listen to these two people, I hear them is telling South Africans that they are the only people who can save South Africa. They are the only one. And they are trying to protect uh, the, uh, the Western Cape uh, from black people. What's your view? Uh, um, I'm confused uh, uh, to come to this conclusion. What's your take after listening to these uh, uh, two leaders of the DA? And I'm also sharing uh, a clip as the last part of this video of uh, the speech of, G uh, uh, of Julius Malema. He was addressing, uh, I think it's a, a business, a black business council. Please listen to the speech up to the, the end. You will understand uh, what Julius Malema stands for. He addresses uh, most of the, 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 the problem which are uh, currently being experienced by South Africa. Please, watch the, the, even if you, you don't watch it on one sitting, uh, you can watch part because uh, this video has, has become long. So I will understand if you watch part and con continue later. But it's important uh, to listen to the speech 
up, up to the end so that you understand his thinking so that when we we we, we talk about the uh, i'm coming to uh, to tomorrow with another video to discuss about this uh, speech of Judas Malema so that you have a clear understanding of what, uh, what I'm talking about when I, I post a video tomorrow about uh, my analysis on Julius Malema's speech. Thank you for, for watching and please do subscribe to this channel so that uh, you, uh, you keep updated on what we're discussing so that we come uh, to make a good choice come the 29th of uh, May. BBC President Sandy Lezungu and the collective leadership, President of UDM, the spokesperson of the ANC, uh, the policy head of the GA, President of the IFP, Minister of Women, and all important people gathered here and delegates. President Zungu, I also saw former leadership of BBC Zelorasta who was trying to do something similar to this. I don't know if you will succeed. <laughs> Let us begin with the obvious crucial question. And that is the post-1994 business regime has maintained and seeks to maintain consistently the colonial role of black people in a predominantly white economy, which is to be merely manifest. The qualitative definition of a black manager as it was under the colonization and apartheid regime is the same today. A mere executive who manages the common affairs of the bourgeoisie who are white racist. And this is a reflection in the forms of crisis which are facing our country today. The dependable and trusted statistics of South Africa told us that in the last quarter of 2019, more than 10.3 million people are unemployed and 103 million of them are black people. These are young people full of energy, willing and ready to work today. Even those that have looked for a job and have given up on looking. If there is an opportunity to work today, they will work. There are 8.1 million young people between the age of 15 and 34 years of age, people who are supposed to be transiting from dependency to the stage of independence productive members of society, adding value to the country's GDP, but are not in education, training, or employment. They are idle and doing nothing every day, and this is a sign of a serious crisis. The economy is not growing. Instead, it is going in the opposite direction, and this has been the case for many years now. There are those who are in denial about this reality. According to the state's essay figures released on Tuesday, we are in a recession, not in a technical recession, Mr. Kulema. This is a third recession since 1994, and we've had two of these recessions under the new dawn with investment envoy, investment summits, and investment pledges. All the sectors that are supposed to form the core of industrial policy suffered negative growth, manufacturing, electricity, gas, water, transport, communication, agriculture, and trade, even government suffered a negative growth of 0.4%. Those who are responsible for growing the economy are living in their own bubble of hallucination and ignorance. The Minister of Finance says we have a strong economy and we will bounce back. The Governor of South African Reserve Bank says South Africa must listen to the Minister of Finance to avoid crisis. But the reality is that we can't listen to a minister who says nothing. <laughs> the state-owned companies are even in much deeper crisis. As from Nell, Transnet, Plaza, Waterfalls, the SAPC, and the list goes on. Escort is in a serious and bigger threat to the discuss in the South African economy. The collapse of ESCOM will lead to unimaginable collapse of all of us in this country. Government has put guarantee of more than 180 billion with an exposure of almost 100 billion. 
as from debt guaranteed by government is more than 350 billion. This is 72 percent of total government debt guarantee. It means that as from collapse tomorrow, we must go to government budget and get 350 billion to pay the debt of ESCOM. Last night, the ESCOM board told the standing committee of public accounts in parliament that they've got no place, they don't even know where the money will come from to service this debt. There is no guarantee that there will be electricity tomorrow. You cannot even start the small business because if the smallest business needs electricity. We are told that there is a turnaround strategy in Tinel, but Tinel is also in crisis. Revenues are declining in Tinel. We have realized that Tinel has lost almost one billion and we are going to lose more. There is no clear turnaround strategy. We have seen under the new law more than 700 million of rent invested in research being reduced to mere 100 million. How do you compete for international contracts in renovation spaces when you are sitting with all the research ending very beneficial relationships with institutions like CSFIR? This is happening under the new job. If it was Zuma withdrawing all of these investments in research and all those types of things, they would have said, appreciate the need for research. These, these are the people who claim to be educated and appreciate the importance of research and innovation, yet they reduce uh, resources for such uh, initiatives. Prasa is looted. There is nothing left in Prasa except the name Prasa. <laughs> we are having a situation where Prasa uh, electricity is cut not because there is no shape, but because Prasa is simply failing to pay electricity. And this leads to hundreds of workers, domestic workers, federal attendants, teachers, stranded in areas like Cape Town. And those are the people who have bought the tickets, monthly tickets. And if the trains are not moving, they've got no alternative because they've invested all of their money in those monthly uh, tickets. Minister of Transport had for the first time that the Prasa budget will be reduced when he was listening to the budget speech in Parliament, which means that even the new dawn doesn't plan collectively. They do not know what they are doing. We have a, a problem of lack of transformation in the economy. And this economy which is not growing, it is wide open. This economy which is not producing jobs, it is wide open. It is not owned by black people. But there is no serious criticism of it because it is wide open. Imagine if this economy was to enter a decision it is owned by black people, will be referred to as another failed African state. But if it is white owned and enters recession, all types of nice names are found to justify why we are in a recession. 90.5% of the total banking sector assets are controlled by Standard Bank, FNB, APSA, Capital, First Rent, and all of them are wide owned and controlled. The insurance sector forget there is no even significant space for black people. It is wide owned and they pollute because they sit in different boards. You find the CEO of my way sitting in a board of Santa, yet they say they are two competing companies. We have a problem of manufacturing in South Africa, and even what is called manufacturing in South Africa is actually not manufacturing, it is assembly. Because vehicle manufacturing, which accounts for more than 85% manufacturing output, is white foreign owned. So things come from outside to Mercedes Benz South Africa and they get assembled here and we are told that is manufactured. It is not true. VW, Toyota is Japanese owned, VW is German owned, Ford is American owned. 
whatever assembling they are doing here, it means it is produced in their countries and it produces jobs for their people in their countries and only to come to be assembled here in, in South Africa. The same thing in agriculture. For those of us who are involved in agriculture, every time when we go to livestock auctions, you will find white people selling to each other the livestock. Because even if we go, we are just spectators, we do not have the necessary resource to compete with them. We are facing a serious problem of unemployment, poverty and inequality because the economy, it is not transformed. 800 billion state procurement budget benefits white companies. Everything that the state procures, you are guaranteed that big debt is going to be one of the biggest beneficiaries of such procurement by the state. was telling Parliament Scopper last night about procurement transactions done through TV sheets and all of them were with white owned companies. There are some of the biggest state contracts done through sole source supply and deviation without anyone looking. In ESCOM today, the white COO and the white CEO, they are engaged in sole sourcing supply which is targeting strictly white companies. All those black companies which were in BEE deals with white companies under Brian Hollywood are told that those joint ventures are no longer applicable, giving the COO or even the CEO an opportunity to source from those white companies without the previous obligations which were entered into before. The new CEO of ESCO came with four companies to ESCO. He's not six months in ESCO. <laughs> he came with four white-owned companies. And he said it yesterday with Scopa in Parliament that we have brought these four companies to come and help us in ESCO. These are the companies that are preparing you know, the specifications in terms of the tenders that are going to take place in ESCO. After compiling those specifications, they are themselves going to tender for the same tender that they have prepared specifications for. These companies, the CEO of ESCO has given them to supply chain without following the due process. But we were told that these wines are brought into ESCO to come and correct the corruption of black people. It is the same arrangement we have seen with the Guptas. The state capital tells us today that the Guptas were hand-picking companies to state-owned enterprises. The white CEOs are doing the same things as the Guptas, bringing companies without following the due process. I'm telling you this information, which is a public information. You do not know about it because this corruption is conducted by white people. It is not corruption when it is done by white people. Can you imagine if Brian Mulliver gone with four companies and said these four companies that are black-owned are going to help us to transform ESCO? It is not something that is in the headline because it is committed by a white CEO. We must reclaim our economy. And there cannot be there cannot be a reclaiming of the economy without a fundamental change. The white people tell you that the way you want to go about it, you are going to disrupt and collapse this economy. But the reality is, and I'm here I'm speaking to in the black elite, many of you have gone through renovation of houses. You know what happens when you renovate a house. There is disruption. There is no way we can transform this economy without disrupting this economy. We need to expropriate our land without compensation. Because when they came here, they never paid a 
take compensation. It was taken through black genocide. It will not be for the first time that the state becomes a, a custodian of critical resource in South Africa. We know that the state is a custodian of mineral resources in South Africa. These mineral resources were before owned by private companies. And the state adopted a policy that made the state a custodian of mineral resources. We are now calling for the state to be a custodian of a natural resource called the land. It is not different from the mineral resources. That which we are calling for was done before through mineral resources. And when we say let the state be the custodian of the land, we do not mean that the Van Gogh who owns a farm there is going to be taken from Van Gogh. Van Gogh will own that farm even when the state is the custodian of the land. And he will only own it if he continues to do what is the purpose of that land. The day he stops farming, he loses that land that is given to a person who is prepared to continue farming in the past. No one loses a house. You continue to own that house for as long as it is used for residential purposes. But once you turn it into a massage parlor, it is no longer saving its people. Therefore, it must be given to a person who will use that land for the rightful purpose. This message, they understand it very well. They deliberately distort it. They even want to accuse the, those who are advocating for land expropriation without compensation. They want to accuse us for this recession. If we are in a recession because people can't trust the ownership of the land by black people, then let it be. Because when the land is owned by white people, there is no decision. But when it is owned by black people, it will lead into a decision. And you all join them and say that will cause a decision. Because black is a, it's a, what causes a decision. We must never accept that explanation. We are equally capable to own an economy. We are equally capable to own the land. And therefore, there is no investor who must suspect us on the basis of the color of our skin. Yeah. Because if you choose the color of the skin to determine whether you are going to invest or not, then you are a racist investor who has got no place in South Africa. We would rather swim in a recession than to benefit from the proceeds of a racist investor who doesn't want the right to own us of this land to participate meaningfully in the ownership of the economy. We want the uniform produced for nurses, for police, for soldiers, for patients in hospitals, for prisoners. Everything that has got uniform in this country and is owned by the state, that uniform must be produced in South Africa. We must have a clear policy about that. We cannot have traffic cops wearing a uniform that is written proudly produced in China. Yet you say this is a back road, a, a police officer looking after the interests of South Africa wearing a proudly Chinese uniform. <laughs> it's an insult to all of us as South Africans. And I don't understand why our government cannot take a simple policy position that says the food we are going to eat in hospitals, in prisons, in schools, those food are going to be produced from the farms from South Africa. And if we are going outside, we will go to Africa. Only when we fail in Africa, we will go and try somewhere else in the world. We need to stabilize ESCO. We can talk all of this, but if we cannot stabilize ESCO, we are finished, because all of this will require electricity. These uh, independent power producers, we must scrap them. They are the few indeed that are connected to President Ramaphosa, to Patrice Mosebe, to a former minister of energy, Jeff Hardy. We need to scratch them. Who said that?
who said as one cannot produce an, an alternative energy? If there is a need for an alternative energy, why can't we capacitate ESCOM to do the same? Instead of outsourcing this responsibility and giving to the family of the president, we have a problem here uh, of the family called the Kutas. We shouldn't create another problem of a family called Patrice Mosebe's family. We must be able to say these things must be able to benefit our people and the only way it can benefit our people it is when it is stayed old. We have no problem with the Patrice Mosebe uh, or his family. We are disagreeing on the approach. And because in South Africa, when you criticize each other, you confuse that for hatred because we suffer from self-hatred. We don't hate ourselves. We criticize one another because we don't want parties to fall under the same category as the Buddhas. He should not make such a terrible mistake as a good businessman who will later be destroyed by the simple things that we should actually let go. Patrice should appreciate that his proximity to the president and being the brother of the wife of the president should take a little bit of a back seat, particularly when it comes to issues that involve the state. Because even if he wins them fairly and swayly, we'll always suspect that this one is a It looks like we're going into a serious crisis. We have delivered the country into the hands of the Rupets and the Oppenheimers. Whether you agree with me or not, I don't care. Because I want to afford the Rupets in 2011. You only came to the party four years later. I know that the EFF is always ahead. And we are very patient with you. You always catch up later. We are controlled by the Rupert, we are controlled by the investors, we are controlled by the Oppenheimers. They have deployed Ravine to look after their interests. They told Zuma, buy on his face the day he removed Ravine. It's not a joke. They went to him and said, we will collapse this thing if Ravine doesn't come back. And when those white CEOs went to tell Zuma to reinstate the minister, it was not a state capture. It was not business interference. The white owners of the economy told Zuma that if you remove this one, you don't reinstate this one, we will collapse this economy, we will take what which, that which belongs to us and leave. Johan Rupert made a similar remark that if D.D. Mahuza becomes the president of South Africa, he will be left with no option but to take what belongs to him. He's in a way telling you who you should elect. You are being told and dictated to by white monopoly capital who should become the next president. And knowing this ones of my relatives, in the ANC, they are likely to listen to what Rupert says because they are scared of white and capital. We must never be scared of white capital if we want to transform the economy. Coming to you, black business, you seem to be extremely comfortable to manage the economy of white people. Many of you do not engage critically against the status quo with the hope that you will be called upon to serve in a particular board or to chair a particular board. You want to be in good books at the same time you claim to be advocating for transformation in business. You will never transform it if you are going to sweep talk the status quo. The only way you are going to a radical position and standing fair on that position. You rather die with your boots on. 
You cannot be this flexible people who are unprincipled, always seeking to be politically correct. Leaders who seek to be politically correct represent nothing. They are actually political amoebas. They are shapeless. They change the form and shape as they go along. The EFF's year, the theme of the year is a year of action against the racist financial sector in South Africa. It is racist all of it because we are all profiled. Even Mutsipe is profiled. By virtue of being a black African, we are all profiled. We are treated like we are criminals in South Africa. As long as it's a black person, extra measures are taken to see if you qualify for this law. If you die and if you work, it is reported that you, you are dead and even death certificate is supplied. More investigations are made to confirm if you are dead. <laughs> because you are a criminal even when you are dead. They can never trust you. We are being profiled. If you have to change a black family to carry a dead person into an old mutual offices in Devon to show them that indeed this person is dead because that certificate is not enough for uh, financial services to be provided for black people. So we can talk anyhow we want to talk without a radical stand what we know. We want to depend on white people to transform the economy. You even want the market view. You want the, the rating agencies to come and tell you who are these rating agencies. Who are the markets? Those are the same people you want to take over from. And you say to them, we want to come and take over from you. Help us to take over from you. It will never happen. The EFF last year taken a decision to establish a private school from grade zero to grade 12 owned by the EFF. Why? Because we realize that black people with money do not own schools. They are private jets. They are private resorts. They have got game farms, but they do not own schools. It takes less than what they own to just build a private school. And after this resolution, I have not met Patrice because I wanted to ask him. <laughs> Why are you not owning a school? <laughs> Even if you name it after yourself, it's your money. Why are you not owning a private school that you just take black people there and educate them? Why? Because education is critical and is at the center of everything we're speaking about. Two things they denied us. They took the land and they took proper education from us. If we can correct those two, who will be able to stand on our own. A school owned by the EFF, guess what happened after we make an announcement? A white man comes and says, I want to give the EFF a 10 hectares piece of land so that you can build a school. It's a very powerful idea. In response to him, I said, we do not want a free land from the white man. We want to buy it. So that if this school becomes an excellent, powerful, successful school, it should not have a print of a white man. Because the idea is that everything successful must have a white person. And that's not all I want to lead a project without a white man's school print. And I want it to succeed so that from the beginning and the end, there is no white man who has made any contribution. But if they come, they will come as employees and will pay them. Thank you. <laughs>